This is war. War and its masses. War and its men. War and its machines. Together they form the big picture. Welcome to the big picture. I'm Captain Carl Zimmerman. The big picture is a report to you from your army. An army committed by you, the people of the United States, to stop communist aggression wherever it may strike. The big picture traces the course of events in the Korean campaign through first-hand reports of our combat veterans and through film taken by combat cameramen of the Army Signal Corps. These are the men who daily record on film the big picture as it happens, where it happens. Today our big picture brings into focus the turning of the tide you'll see our fight to hold on to the Pusan perimeter. You'll see air support from our carriers, the invasion of Walmy, and the march on Seoul. And you'll hear a first-hand report from Lieutenant Tom Dreisenstock, platoon leader with the Army's 24th Infantry Division. Now, let's go back to August 1950. On 10 August, after 47 days of fighting in Korea, the tide of battle in the Pusan beachhead is ebbing and flowing for both sides. United Nations forces are dug in along a 120-mile perimeter. Communist troops, still outnumbering ours more than two to one, have thus far failed in their objective to drive UN forces into the sea or destroy them before we can take the offensive. At the southern end of our beachhead, Task Force Keene, consisting of units of the 25th Infantry Division, the 5th Regimental Combat Team, and the 1st Marine Brigade, are driving toward Chinju in our first offensive of the war. This counteroffensive throws back the Reds, who are about to launch a major attack only 35 miles from Pusan, key port for the entire beachhead. Southwest of Taigu, U.S. troops are reducing a communist bridgehead. South of Waiguan, U.S. troops are containing another bridgehead. North of Waiguan, a counterattack by South Korean troops pushes communists back across the river. Along the northern perimeter, west of Wisong, communists compel South Koreans to withdraw. At Pohang, red troops have broken through the perimeter, threatening that port city and its airfield. However, to the north, South Koreans have recaptured Yongdok. In the air, Air Force, Navy, and Marine planes are giving support to ground troops along the perimeter. They also blast communications and military industrial targets from Taigu to the North Korean's northern border. Guns of United Nations ships also help in this mission. The struggle to defend the beachhead is a furious one, but we are holding. On 24 August, on the central sector, which is concerned with the defense of Taigu and the Naktong River Line, engineers have built a ponton bridge across a tributary of the Naktong. This ponton bridge serves for the use of lighter vehicles and foot soldiers. But with increasing supplies moving in, there is need for a heavy equipment bridge. South Korean civilian labor is employed. Although in many sections, primitive native tools are still used, and although U.S. engineers depend greatly on Korean manpower, there is a change now since the early days of the war. Heavy construction equipment is becoming a familiar sight. An accumulation of this type of equipment, necessarily second in priority to arms and ammunition, is an indication of the vast bulk of supplies that are now being received. On 29 August, 
The British aircraft carrier Unicorn moves into Pusan Harbor. On deck are British troops bound for the Korean battlefront. Within a week, they are rushed to fight alongside 1st Cavalry troops east of Waiguan to help stop a threatened breakthrough along the Naktong River. These troops are the first infantrymen of a foreign nation to join in the United Nations police action. They are members of the Argyll and Sutherland Highlanders, composed largely of Scotsmen and the Middlesex Regiment, most of whom hail from the London area. Almost all of these Britishers have served in Hong Kong for six months, where they underwent rigorous training in hilly country very similar to that of Korea. Except for the 3.5 bazooka and U.S. supplied rations, these Britishers will use their own weapons and supplies. Their uniforms are jungle green, with only the regimental pipers wearing the kilts, which won the Scots the nickname, the Ladies from Hell. A C-47 transport plane is loaded with leaflets, which will be dropped over North Korean territory. These drops are being made frequently to counter enemy propaganda. The C-47 transports carry heavy loads of leaflets for long trips into North Korea. For shorter trips, T-6s are used. Safe conduct passes. If the leaflet is found on a North Korean soldier by his own officers, the penalty is death. Over enemy territory, the packets are thrown out, and the wind takes care of sorting and delivery. Enemy captives report that these messages are often memorized to avoid the danger of having the leaflet found on the person. On 30 August, the Reds are gaining in the south and in the central sector, but in the northeast, near Pohang, United States and South Korean units are holding their ground against heavy opposition. In this fight near Pohang is a company of the 24th Infantry Division supported by a platoon of tanks. These units are moving forward to attack a red position called Hill 148, a ridge about one mile west of Pohang. The communist drive in this area is a three-pronged thrust along the 10-mile front between Kigi and Pohang. At this time, Pohang is in allied hands. The enemy is infiltrating here, one group of unknown size having set up a roadblock south of Pohang, three miles behind the allied lines. Infantry and tanks coordinate activities as they approach the jumping off point. Intelligence has revealed that the communist attack on Pohang is an attempt to fulfill orders given the local red commander to take the city at all costs in the next 24 hours. And for the Reds, it is a costly operation. An estimated 2,000 North Koreans have been killed in the last two days. Although U.S. elements are here in some strength, the weight of the attack is against the South Korean Army's 3rd and Capital Divisions and their 17th Regiment. This is the 10th week of the Korean War, and the fighting on all fronts has reached a peak of fury. Although at this time, military spokesmen are mentioning early offensive moves, the present situation does not appear optimistic. Enemy fire is in common. Information goes back to the company commander. The CO's orders come forward. The attack on Hill 148 is about to begin. The attack gets underway slowly at first and then with an increasing firefight. This is one small action in the big fight that is raging along the entire 150-mile front in Korea. A few miles of territory changes hands again and again. If the Allied line cracks at any point, the whole Pusan beachhead can be lost. Those were trying times for all of us. Our troops jammed into the small area of the Pusan perimeter, defending against great odds, and at the same time, building strength for the eventual offensive. Lieutenant Tom Dreisenstock was there. Tom served as a platoon leader with the Army's 24th Division. Tom, tell us what the defense around the perimeter was like. The defense around the Pusan perimeter consisted mostly of a plugging action. In other words, moving a division 
into uh, the perimeter to fill up a uh, gap uh, penetrated by the enemy. And we did not have enough men to completely fill up a, co a complete rectangle or a perimeter. So therefore, we had to plug up the gaps and by moving the men around. Mm -hmm. When trouble started, you moved men right in there. That's right. Well, what, was the, uh, what were these attacks like, Tom? Well, these attacks were constituted mostly by uh, a preparation of a mortar fire by the enemy. They were very good at this mortar fire. And uh, they outnumbered us, I would say, approximately five to one. Uh, they had a mass of men, and also they infiltrated in between our lines, dressed as civilians, and all together just harassed us by that type of movement. Well, tell us about the uh, breakout, Tom. What were the preparations for it like? Well, the preparations consisted of getting ready, getting our, our ammunition ready, getting our men ready, and the briefings. The uh, higher powers around there said that they believed that the North Korean uh, perimeter around our defense was made up of a thin crust, and that once we penetrated that and broke through, we would be able to continue up north without too much trouble. That's about the way it worked, too, isn't it? Yes, that's the way it did work. Mm -hmm. Well, what about the uh, teamwork as you moved north? How about our air support? Was it good? Did you have it when you wanted it? The air support was very good. Uh, you call for an airstrike and get it almost immediately. One time, I was taking, uh, with my platoon, taking a village, and we were received firing from a uh, hill to our left front. Uh, I called back and asked for air uh, attack, and within five minutes, we had planes coming over and give us, giving us an attack with us within about 50 yards to our front, which is pretty close. It certainly is. That's really getting it in there when you need it. It is. Well, Tom, how about the artillery at that time? The artillery also was very good. The coordination was close. Uh, they gave us very good fire, accurate fire, and the North Koreans were scared to death of the uh, white phosphorus which they fired. Uh, it seemed to have a very bad effect on them, and actually it was good for us. The artillery was excellent. Well, we heard a lot of talk about the uh, fanaticism of the North Koreans. Can you give us any examples of that? Yes, I can. Uh, my platoon was uh, taking a house one time, which uh, housed uh, several members of the Communist Party. We surrounded the house and had an interpreter ask them to come out and surrender, and they refused to do it. Uh, therefore, we had to fire on the house, and as many of them ran out, they shot themselves, and the others pulled pins on grenades and blew themselves up. Uh, they just did not want to be captured at all. Mm. Well, Tom, uh, tell us about the weapons we used over there. How did our weapons compare with those used by the North Koreans? Our weapons were far superior to those of the North Koreans. They were more dependable, our men knew better use of them, and all in all, they gave out more firepower. Uh, the Browning automatic rifle, for instance, is my favorite, and the North Koreans were deathly afraid of it. Uh, it was a very good weapon, and uh, there was no comparison between it and the North Korean Burt gun, as they call it. Uh -huh. Had pretty much respect for that BAR of ours, didn't they? They really did. They were really scared of it. Well, now, Tom, when you're in the line with your men like that, moving a, for a long time, you get to know them pretty well, don't you? Yes, you do. You eat with them, you sleep with them, and every once in a while, one of them gets shot, and you really feel bad. Uh, you get to know them very well. Sergeant Tompkins, who was my platoon sergeant, uh, was an old soldier. He was one, the type of man who really knows his business. And I owe a lot of credit to him for helping me into the platoon. We had younger men. I got to know those, too. Our uh, squad leaders, Freddy, Smokey, and those boys, you really get to know them fairly well. Back around the Pusan perimeter before we broke out, uh, because of the fact that we were shifting around an awful lot, it was very hard to try and size up your men. But uh, regardless of this fact, I believe that we did fairly good and uh, I got a good chance to more or less size up my men. We were moving around quite a bit at that time, though. Well, Tom, it was men like you and the men of your platoon that held back the enemy in the Pusan perimeter against very great odds. You kept that enemy from throwing us back into the sea. Let's watch now as some of our troops throw off a red attack. On 2 September, in the South Central sector, the 1st Marine Brigade is rushed to the battle lines near Yongsan to help throw back one of the main communist thrusts in their all-out offensive along the Naktong River. Communist strategy at this time is an attempt to achieve a major breakthrough between the 2nd Division's southern flank 
and the 25th Division's northern flank. These Marines have been rushed here after a brief rest, during which they regrouped. The Marines move up the high ground they must retake to secure their sector of the counterattack. The enemy is holding his fire momentarily. The Marine counteroffensive has been coordinated with the 2nd Division, the entire action being five-pronged. One tank-supported Marine unit has moved up the main road, leading west from Yongsan, while diagonally on the right and left, other Marines flank the enemy. Farther to the right and left, tank-supported 2nd Division troops advance in wide encircling movements. Marines run forward as the enemy opens fire. A wounded Marine runs back for aid. Other Marines resume the attack, moving slowly and waiting for the enemy to reveal his flanks and main position. Despite North Korean tanks, mortars and automatic weapons, the assault continues. This counterattack along this southern bulge of the Nakdong River is almost a repeat of an assault these same Marines launched two weeks previously when they took this same hill. The high ground in this sector has changed hands at least five times in two weeks. The Marines form a base of fire to drive the enemy off. The line builds up, and so does the firepower. Meanwhile, overhead, Air Force and Marine Corps planes support the ground troops. Carrier planes are ready for another strike on inland targets. Rockets are of particular interest at this time. Three different types are being used. One of the first super explosive types to see service in Korea was the five inch Holy Moses. Later, the 11.75-inch Tiny Tim proved highly effective on bridges and similar large targets. The most recent arrival is the Navy's 6.5-inch Ram. Constant activity on these carriers has not dampened the crewman's sense of humor. It is noteworthy that the Ram rocket set a speed record for production. From its conference room conception to its appearance in combat, it took only 24 days. Aerial missions of the Navy and Marines often include both strategic and tactical action in the same strike. In the relatively small area of Korea, targets of opportunity count heavily. cameras record targets of the carrier planes. Japan. A B-26 raid is in preparation during the week of 6 September. The B-26 is armed with 16 50 caliber machine guns. These guns are electrically operated and a single gunner can bring many of them to bear on the same target at once. The B-26 can carry a 5,000 pound bomb load or five of these 1,000 pounders. With these bombs plus napalm plus the heavy firepower of the machine guns, a B-26 flight is a formidable attacking unit. These planes have seen constant use in the Korean War, their targets ranging from strategic industrial areas in the north to tactical areas along the battle lines in the south. The B-26 is classified as a light bomber with a speed of more than 350 miles an hour. After their final briefing, crew members head for the field. 
This has become a familiar scene in United States air bases in Japan from which B-26 sorties are flown on an around-the-clock schedule. These B-26 Douglas Invaders were formerly called A-26 bombers. They differ from the B-26 Martin Marauders used in World War II. The present B-26 is a very adaptable plane which is often revamped for different purposes. Cannon may be substituted for the nose gun. The plane can be adapted to carry a variety of explosives, for the B-26 is designed primarily for low-level bombing. It is seldom used for the high-altitude work of the B-29. are in the area of Seoul during the first week of September. The little flashes of light on the ground are tracers from the B-26 machine guns. Occasionally, enemy flak comes up at the plane. On 7 September, the U.S. Air Force flew 625 sorties in 24 hours. On 15 September, dawn breaks off the island of Walmy. Ships of the UN fleet fire point blank at the island. Rockets join the softening up process. General MacArthur watches from the bridge of the flagship. This landing is a calculated risk. General MacArthur is using many of his reinforcements from the south. The first wave hits the beach. Because of the 30-foot tidefall, landing craft in the first waves must be run ashore in a period one hour before high tide and two hours after. The first troops landed here will have to stick it out alone until the next tide, 11 hours later. A bulldozer smothers a red dugout. A firefight begins. All the reds haven't been driven off by the bombardment. Captives are stripped to prevent concealment of weapons. Others are a little more formal. On 16 September, the 1st Marine Division moves through Inchon. This city is recaptured against relatively light resistance. Allied casualties are few. As these men move through Inchon, their objective is Seoul. There are two Allied moves on Seoul, one from the south and another sweeping around from the north across the Han River. The Han is crossed, a river village is taken, and the Marines move on toward Seoul. But there is bitter fighting ahead. Seoul is heavily defended. As these vehicles move on toward Seoul, the Marines have a message for the Reds. Enjoy yourself. It's later than you think. During the six weeks between 10 August and 20 September, the period covered by this combat bulletin, there were three main phases in the Korean fighting. On 10 August, reinforced United Nations forces were dug in to defend at all costs a beachhead perimeter bounded by the Naktong River. We could withdraw no farther. 
could no longer trade space for time if we were to hold our beachhead and the vital supply port of Pusan. Communist forces were threatening Pohang, Taigu, and Masan in their drive at Pusan. We had launched our first counterattack from Masan toward Chinju to stop the most dangerous communist drive. On 1 September, the communists launched their biggest drive of the war all along our beachhead perimeter. It was an all-out effort to take Busan, eliminate our beachhead in Korea, and destroy United Nations forces. We were being pushed back again toward Masan, Taigu was in danger from the north and south, and Pohang was being taken and retaken. By 20 September, the tide of battle had changed completely. Five days previously, U.S. Marines had made an amphibious landing at Incheon, 150 miles behind the enemy lines. The enemy, still pressing his all-out drive for Busan, was suddenly cut off from his supplies. On 20 September, U.S. Marines were entering the outskirts of Seoul as U.S. 7th Division infantrymen fanned southward to head off communists retreating from the southern front. On our southern beachhead, United Nations forces were crossing the Naktong River and moving ahead everywhere. They were advancing at Pohang, south of Wisong, north of Taigu and at Waiguan, west of Changyong and west of Masan. We had held our beachhead. Now we were on the offensive, and it was the beginning of the end for the communist invasion of South Korea. Those were the events that comprised the big picture from August 20th to September 20th, 1950. Our thanks to Lieutenant Tom Dreisenstock for being with us today. Next week, our big picture will show the United Nations forces on the offensive. You'll see our recapture of the city of Seoul, the fall of the North Korean capital of Pyongyang, an airdrop by the 187th Regimental Combat Team. And you'll see the Missouri, the Big Mo in action, giving support to our ground troops. And with us again will be a combat veteran who saw, as it happened, a part of the big picture. This is Captain Carl Zimmerman inviting you to be with us then.